We're in our series entitled Easter Viewpoints, and a couple of weeks ago we examined the passion of Christ from the perspective of the two, of the two Herods who ruled during the time of Jesus' birth and the time of his crucifixion. And then last week we talked about Pilate and choices, the Pilate of choices that he made and how important choices are in our lives today. Today we're going to explore uh, the, the Passion Week, the, the week leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus, the, the death, burial, and resurrection we call Easter, with a perspective of another group. And it's not just one person, it's the group we call the crowd. Now, crowds can be easily influenced or distracted by skilled communicators with an agenda. As a result, crowds often have practically no idea about what is actually going on right in front of them. Uh, someone once said, the great masses of people will more easily fall victims, notice the word victims, will more easily fall victims to a great lie rather than a small lie. You know who said that? Adolf Hitler said that. And he proved it to be true as he led Germany with a great lie into World War II. Crowds also tend to be very fickle, subject to group thinking, whatever public opinion is popular at the time. As a result, F. W. Borum, who was a great preacher in New Zealand, Australia, a Baptist preacher during the first part of the 1900s, he was a prolific writer, wrote over 40 books, and he said this, the multitude is a fickle master. Now, as the Jerusalem crowd of Jesus was, was no different in their day. In fact, they were just as dangerous and volatile as many crowds in history today. At Jesus' triumphal entry, the, the day Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, the colt of a donkey, the masses praised him. One week later, he was standing before Pilate and the mob was booing and screaming for his blood. Mark 11, 7 through 10 gives us a picture of the first part of this story. Mark 11, 7 through 10 reads this way. And then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Verse 9. And then those who went before and those who followed cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Verse 10. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, <laughs> This event is known as the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. They, they cut off uh, palm branches and laid them on, on the ground in front of the little donkey he was riding on. Some even took their coats off and laid them down. They were celebrating the entry of really the king of the Jews. They, they recognized this. I call this Jesus' hero day. Everybody say hero. Uh, I didn't hear you. Everybody say hero. All right, that's better. It was his hero day. We just read Jesus was given a hero's welcome when he came riding into Jerusalem. That day, people laid their clothes, clothes down, their coats, everything for Jesus to enter into Jerusalem. It was an incredible time. It was a prophetic moment, really. Why did they do all this? What, what caused the response of the crowd? Well, I think Matthew indicates that even the people in Jerusalem who had never actually seen Jewish Jesus knew who he was. They'd heard about the miracles. It was just a few days before that Lazarus was raised from the dead. Many people saw that, and they'd come to Jerusalem telling about this incredible miracle. Zechariah 9.9 had been something in their minds because they would have been familiar with this scripture. It says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Now notice, your king is coming to you. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation. Now notice this, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. That's exactly what Jesus did. And as he came in the Passover feast, riding on the colt of the donkey, many people recognized and connected this scripture in Zechariah to the fact that this is our Messiah. He's coming. Jesus, Jesus is Messiah. Hosanna to the son of David, which is a reference to the Messiah. In fact, they were actually quoting Psalm 118. The term Hosanna was a Hebrew expression which means save. Psalm 118, 25 and 26 says, Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Verse 26, blessed 
is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were actually quoting scripture. So the people of Jerusalem were thrilled beyond measure. And the problem was this. The problem with the crowd was they completely misunderstood what Jesus had come to them for. They thought he was going to establish a, a kingdom, a kingdom like the Roman kingdom. You see, it was only about 200 years earlier that Israel enjoyed a time of self-rule. But they, uh, they had their independence from the fading Greek empire. But there were two factions, two groups of Jews that, that fought against each other. It seems like there's always at least two groups that are fighting against each other. And these two factions were, were really in great contention. And somebody had the, they thought was a good idea, of calling in a Roman general. His name was Pompey. And they asked him to come in and to, to settle the dispute on which faction was going to rule Israel. Well, Pompey had a better idea. His idea was that he would rule Jerusalem, so he brought the Roman forces in and made Jerusalem and all of Israel a Roman province, much to the demise of the Jewish people. They believed that Jesus was now going to unseat the Roman leadership there and once again return them to independence, but Jesus had a bigger idea. See, Jesus wasn't there just to save Israel. Jesus had come to save the world. Jesus' plan was much bigger than what their plan. See, the kingdom he came to overthrow was the kingdom of darkness. The kingdom of darkness that entered this world and took authority in the Garden of Eden. When Satan deceived Adam and Eve and took the authority of this world over. Now Jesus, the second Adam, as the word says, has come back to take that authority back to rob Satan of the keys of death, hell, and the grave, which he did through the crucifixion and the resurrection. But they didn't understand that. This crowd didn't understand what Jesus was doing. In Matthew 4, 17, when Jesus began his earthly ministry, he began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Even in what we call the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, Jesus says, pray this way, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, he was announcing that there was a new king in town, but not the kind of king they were thinking about. So the cheering crowd thought Jesus was coming to save them from the Romans, but God had a completely different plan. Now, let me ask the question. Can anybody here today relate to that crowd in Jerusalem? Let, let, me, let me define that question a little better. Have you ever thought that God was going to do one thing and it turned out he was doing something different all along. Have you ever put God in a little box and says, now God, this is what I want you to do. Here's the plan. Here is how you can solve this problem in my family. Here's how you can solve the problem in my marriage. Here's how you can solve the problem in my children. God, here's the plan. We give God a plan and say, okay, God, now execute my plan. Here's how you can fix my, my finances. Here's how you can fix my, my job, my, my, my church. Here's how you, God, now here's a plan to fix Pastor Gary right here. Now, if you just, if you just follow this, God, you, he's going to be a whole lot better if you just, and God has a different plan. In fact, God always has a bigger plan. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, saith the Lord, nor are your ways my ways. Verse 9, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Does that mean that we shouldn't be specific when we pray and ask for specific things? No, the Bible tells us very clearly, teaches us very clearly to be specific when we pray. But we should also end every prayer with what Jesus prayed in Gethsemane. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. See, Jesus knew the plan of God. He knew why he was here. He knew why he was going to the cross. He knew all that. He knew that. And he said, Lord, it, not my will, but thy will be done. In other words, God, whatever you've got going on, the big picture, don't, don't let me get so focused on how I see things to miss the big picture. Now, let me just add right here that as, as a nation and as a people of what we're going through with this pandemic right now, 
don't, don't get your eyes on just our needs so much, our current needs. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not getting to work or my business is not going well and, and I've had to lay off people or I've been laid off and, and I'm not getting to church and, I, and the kids aren't at school. And, and instead of focusing, and, and we have to deal with those, we all do, we have to deal with our daily situations. But don't get so consumed by those that we miss perhaps that there's something much larger that God may be doing. No, I'm not blaming this on God. I'm not assessing this to God. I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm, that's a little above my pay grade I've, I've learned through the years. But what I am saying is when we look at things going on around us right now, don't get so caught up in the day-to-day -day situations that we, we forget that God has a bigger picture in mind. I was talking to a leading evangelist last night on the phone. He said, I've heard it reported that already in this, and during this season of, of this, this, this pandemic here in America, that over one million people have given their hearts to the Lord in America. Now, the news, the news agencies are not going to report that. But what happens when it's 10 million, 20 million, or maybe 100 million? It could happen. It really could. It could happen. You see, there's a bigger picture in mind. You say, but pastor, I don't understand. Good. You and I are halfway there when we don't understand. You say, what do you mean, Pastor? Well, let me show you something. Trust isn't really trust until you don't understand. One of my favorite verses, many favorites, is Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own, what's that next word? Oh, yeah, understanding. Lean not to your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. What it's saying is that you don't have to understand to have faith. He says, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. So you may say, God, I don't understand what's going on, but I'm trusting you in this. I don't understand how this is going to be taken care of, but I'm going to trust you in this. I don't, I don't understand how life is going to be, but I'm trusting you in this. So, well, pastor, why is it so important that we learn to trust God and Leave room for him to work his plan in our life. Well, because if you don't, you begin to think that God's working for you instead of us working for God. See, it's very easy. It's very easy for us to get a concept that, well, if I pray, God does this. If I do this, God does this. If I fast, God has to do this. So God's just waiting for us to push the jump button and he jumps. It's not that way at all. No, we are supposed to pray fast in all those Christian disciplines that positions us for blessing in our life. Those are good choices. But it doesn't mean that God is going to do everything we tell Him to do. We serve Him. He doesn't serve us. He's God and we're not. And it's so important. Now, the same crowd that shouted, Hosanna in the streets, Hosanna to the highest, they cut down palm branches and, and laid their, their coats on, on the ground there and, and their outer garments so that the donkey wouldn't have to touch the ground as Jesus was riding him into Jerusalem. That same crowd earlier that week is now screaming a few days later, crucify him, crucify him. What in the world is going on? I call this Jesus' zero day. You see, I had a hero day and a zero day. Let me just take time for a little personal story right here. I learned this many years ago as a young pastor. Everything seemed to be going good. I mean, we were working hard. I was working and, 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 and 16 hours a day, and, and we were doing everything we know to do, and the church was growing, and we, we had a Sunday school banquet to celebrate all of our workers, and it went awesome. I mean, it was packed out. People were excited. And people, one by one, people would get up and just share a testimony. And this gentleman got up and uh, he shared a testimony. He was uh, close to retirement age at the time. And I'm like 30 years old at that time. And he gets up in front of those people. He says, uh, since I've been coming to this church, I've learned more about God, more about the Bible than I have in my entire life put together. And I've been going to church all my life. And he just bragged on me as such a wonderful young pastor and how good a teacher I was and all that. It wasn't a two or three weeks later that uh, some people in the church got upset about something. In fact, it was something in a new building program. And uh, one wanted to put one type of wall up. One wanted something else. And they got upset because they didn't get their way. And a few other things happened. And, and they caused... Uh, 
a little bit of a, a big problem. And this man got caught up in that and came into my office. And he shook his finger in my face. He says, this church is going down and I'm leaving it before it does. This is the same man that a couple of weeks earlier stood and said, I've learned more in this church and, and, and since I've been here, which was about a year, than I've learned in my entire life. And then a couple of weeks later, he's, he's shouting, crucify you. I, that's where I learned that one day I could be a hero and the next day I could be a zero. And for me, to not paying attention to either one of those, not accept either one of them. And no, the church didn't go down. It's a thriving church there today. It went all church served, went, did well. It was just a moment there, but he got caught up in the crowd. Don't get caught up in the crowd. And I'm going to talk about that a little more here in a moment. So Jesus now has a hero day, but now he has a zero day. We find that in Mark chapter 15, 9 through 15. But Pilate answered them saying, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Or, for he knew that the chief priest had handed him over because of envy. Even Pilate knew what was going on. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd. Notice that, they stirred up the crowd. The chief priest didn't respond. The chief priest stirred up the crowd. Let me tell you, there's always a stir behind the crowd. When you see the crowd yelling and screaming and doing all those things, even when you watch TV and you watch the news today, you see people picketing against things and yelling and screaming. There's always a stir behind the crowd. You won't see their face hardly ever on TV, but there's somebody stirring the crowd. And they stirred up the crowd so that they rather release Barabbas to them. Barabbas was a horrible uh, criminal. He was the worst criminal they had there in the prison. Pilate answered, said to them, what then do you want me to do with him who's called the king of the Jews? So they cried out again, crucify him. Wow. Then Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? But they cried out even more, crucify him. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. Now, we, do, we just looked at the hero days of Jesus. Let's look at the zero day. The zero day, the Jewish leaders who had hated Jesus because he had threatened their position and their power, finally managed to twist a plot that would bring about his execution. But they needed help. They needed the crowd. They knew that they alone could not, could not persuade Pilate. They knew they needed a crowd of people to push it. So they stirred up the crowd. Here's some of the things the crowd shouted. They shouted, give us Barabbas. Barabbas was in prison for taking part in an insurrection against the Roman government. In the process, he killed people. He, in other words, it seems the crowd may have favored Barabbas because he did exactly what they hoped Jesus would do, overthrow the Roman government. In our culture today, people don't always try to replace Jesus with the leader. Sometimes they just, they just redefine Jesus until he agrees with them. They don't replace him with someone else. They just redefine Jesus so that Jesus reflects everything that they want to do, everything they believe. But here's the thing about that. If the God you serve always agrees with you, then you're serving a God that you created in your own imagination. And that's a very, very dangerous situation. Because you know the God that you create in your own image is always going to agree with you. The God that you and I create in our own image is always going to say that we're right, we're great, we're awesome, we're wonderful. We need a God who can correct us, a God who can love us, a God who will bless us. Here's another thing they said. We have no king but Caesar. Some of the people who only a couple of days before were shouting Hosanna to the highest are now shouting Caesar's our king. His blood be upon us and our children is another statement they made. How, how little they knew the bone-chilling statement they would make and the pain and the suffering they would go through over the next 2,000 years. One study this reveals something very powerful about the crowd. Now, I want you to understand something about the crowd. It doesn't take a majority to make a history. The crowd that was there that day was not the majority of the people in Jerusalem. I just recently read about one study by the BBC News released a report that concluded that it only takes 3.5% of the population to bring change. Now, that can be scary, but it can be powerful. See, the Jerusalem crowd did not count the cost of rejecting Jesus. Don't make the same mistake. Let me share with you just some things that will help you and I to, to not get caught up in the crowd. 
You see, all of our mistakes can really be summed up into one statement. They forgot that God is God and we are not. You say, Pastor, how, how do I get, like, get caught up in all the things that the crowd is saying? Here's three quick things I want to give you. Number one, stay calm, don't react. Stay calm. When Jesus was confronted by the Pharisees with a woman caught in adultery, the first thing he did, he was stay calm. Stay calm, don't react. Don't, don't say the first thing that comes to your mind. Don't, don't vote the first thing that comes to your mind. Don't, don't do the first thing that comes to your mind. Stay calm, don't react. Number two, gather facts, not feelings. You see, crowds are always motivated by feelings. They're not motivated by facts. That's why you can't talk with somebody that has a crowd mentality and offer them facts. Truth doesn't mean a thing to them. I've done it many, many times through my life as a pastor. I sat down with people who were, who were functioning totally on their feelings and said, here's the truth, here's the facts, here's this, and they would hear none of it. If you don't want to be caught up in the crowd mentality, gather facts, not feelings. And here's the last thing. Process it through prayer. It's amazing what will happen when we pray honestly. Not when we pray, oh God, this is what I'm going to do, bless it. No, no, no. But when we pray honestly, God, what do you want me to do? What are you doing, God? What would you do? What would you do in me? What would be your will? Not my will, not my feelings. What would be your will, God? See, if you want the crowd to follow you, you cannot follow the crowd. You have to set the pace. You have to make the right choice. Let me ask another question. If, if people follow you, where will they end up? Because everybody's following something. Your children, are they following you? Do you want them to follow you? Your coworkers? It's a hard question for us to ask. Well, let me close with this. Jesus gave his life on Calvary, on the cross. We're going to celebrate and honor that next week is Easter. But he went through incredible pain and suffering, and he never allowed the crowd to sway him from his purpose. Don't allow the crowd, any crowd, to sway you from the purpose God has for your life, for the call that God has on your life, for the commitments that you've made in life that honor him. Don't allow any crowd of any kind cause you to get off track in what God has for your life. And if you have, ask God to forgive you right now and get back on track. That's my prayer for you now. Father, I pray now for your grace, your power, and your love. I pray, God, for your word, for the light of the gospel, the light of the revelation of your word to come into people's lives and open their eyes, God. Open all of our eyes. Protect us and guard us, Holy Spirit, from a crowd mentality. And help us, Father, to discern and to hear clearly what you want us to do. And as we commit our ways to you and we acknowledge you and we don't lean to our own understanding, we believe, God, that you will direct our paths. In Jesus' name, amen.